Welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hey everyone, welcome back to the OnScript Podcast. This is Matt Lynch coming to you from Regent College in Vancouver. We have a brand new episode here with the one and only Michael Bird, who's been on the podcast before. And N.T. Wright, this is his first time on, so it's good to have him uh, doing an episode. We, uh, I also want to let you know that, or remind you that we have another podcast called Biblical World that focuses on the history, culture, cultural background, and archaeology of the Bible. So I hope you'll check that one out and that you enjoy it. And um, also thanks to all of you who support the podcast by liking and sharing and spreading the word. Uh, we really appreciate that. So thanks so much for listening and enjoy the episode. Welcome back to On Script. I want to start with a quote from the book, Jesus and the Powers. Yes, you want to avoid the evils of Constantine and Christendom. Instead of seeking influence in the halls of power, you want to be the angry prophet on the margins, speaking truth to power. All well and good. But what happens when the power listens? What happens when the power where the people ask you to sit on a committee, contribute to an investigation, run a program, advise on policy, or serve as a chaplain? That kind of absolute separation of church and state is fine if you want to be a critic making snarky criticisms on the sidelines, but if you want to change the game, you need skin in the game. This is Matthew Bates, professor of theology at Quincy University, but hey, some personal career news to share with all of you at OnScript. I'm transitioning to a new role, professor of New Testament at Northern Seminary. I'm excited to join Northern. Well, after fighting time zones and schedules, we've emerged victorious to record today's episode. Two of my favorite scholars are my guests, the inimitable Mike Bird and the eminent N.T. Wright. Thanks for joining us, Mike and Tom. You're very welcome. Great to be with you, Matt. Now, Mike and Tom have teamed up to write Jesus and the Powers, Christian Political Witness in an Age of Totalitarian Terror and Dysfunctional Democracies. It's co-published, uh, SPCK and Zondervan, brand new, just releasing. Uh, Mike and Tom have previously co-authored The New Testament in Its World. So, all right, gentlemen, let's get this awkward stuff over with immediately. Uh, Mike, uh, what is a challenge you face in writing a book with Tom? Uh well, I mean, there's there's several. Uh, how do you uh, get the time zones right is is one thing, uh, but we also got to make sure we're on, we're on sync on things. You know, there there is there is a slight generational difference for us, and certainly I know some of my jokes don't always land on Tom, um, so that that's one thing. But you know, mainly it's a it's a delight, it's fun, and there's there's a lot of synergy I find uh, between uh, uh, Tom and I when we work things. We 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 really do seem to be singing on the same sheet of gospel music, and we have some of the same concerns. Uh, I think, born of you know, both of us reading the New Testament, and both of us want to see the church thrive uh, and be a faithful witness in what is a very con- contested and combustible world today. All right, Tom. Now, don't hold back. This is your chance to talk about Mike. Uh, what's the worst thing about working with Mike as a co-author? To just hit it with us straight. It, it, too much alliteration. Um, and you can see that. You can see that in the subtitle <laughs> of the book. Totalitarian terrors. I can hardly say it. Right? That's right. Right. And dysfunctional democracies. No, I mean, uh, I, I, Mike. I remember one time uh, the late great um, Dr. Alec Matia, who wrote his big book on Isaiah. He said uh, to preachers, "If you're bitten by the alliterative bug, please take something for it." And uh, he meant in preaching sermons, but, um, you know, 17 points all beginning with Q or whatever it might be. But no, I mean, seriously, Mike writes with an energy and a passion, which is great fun. And I I will sometimes, when editing something that Michael sent to me, I will sometimes just tweak it a bit and tone it down so that we don't have too many purple passages all on top of each other. But I, I I would rather go that route. I mean, um, reading Mike is always fun, um, even if you want to say, oh, come on, that's a bit over the top. Uh, it, it, you never get bored. And uh, the, the, as with novels, so with scholarship, it ought to be the case, though sadly it usually isn't, that uh, thou shalt not be dull. And we, we don't want to be dull. And I think this book isn't dull. I mean, Mike uh, worked on certain aspects of 
political theology, which I hadn't had a chance to get to, and the last couple of chapters particularly, there's all sorts of stuff in there which come from Mike, and I just read it and thought, wow, this is great. Uh, I wish I'd had the time to read all the stuff that he obviously has. But then the rest is collaboration, and, well, we've done that before, and we kind of know how it works, I think. Yeah. So far, so good. Yeah. In fact, I remember that that opening quote you read, um, that, that, that was a paragraph I wrote, but I remember that when Tom saw, saw that, and he go and he put in a comment. He said, "That is a good paragraph." So <laughs> yeah. I felt like, okay, I've, def- I've definitely, I've definitely, definitely landed one. And uh, Tom would have really good criticisms on on, on other parts, but uh, I remember, th- I remember him saying, "That is a good paragraph." Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the whole business of what happens when the the, the protesters get invited to sit at the table and contribute to the discussion. And we've had that in political thought in Britain, you know, when the old Lib Dem party, who were always sniping on the sidelines, suddenly it looked as though they might get into power. And the question went around, did they actually have any policies? Or was it just purely consisting of of knocking what was there? And I think the same very much for a lot of church people who uh, look back at the Constantinian era or so-called Christendom and say, oh, well, you know, blah, blah. Um, but actually, what what would you rather? Um, I've often said to people, um, when the emperor comes and says, there's so many of you Christians that we're, we're going to have to do a deal and, and make this work. Um, what are you going to say? Oh, no, no, please go on killing us and, and uh, throwing us to the lions because that makes us so much more authentic. Now, I think you're going to say, actually... Um, this is new, we're going to have to pray about this, we may get it wrong, there may be pitfalls, but okay, if we believe that Jesus is the Lord of the world, then let's just see what this might look like in practice. Yeah, well well said. Um, Yeah, and I think that in the first chapter, you both make this clear that there is some personal dimension to this project for you. Um, Mike, obviously, was some military experience, but Tom, I learned uh, your father was a prisoner of war. I thought that was interesting. Uh, if you if you'd care to both speak to that as you wish, just briefly, I'll I'll defer. I think Tom's story is more interesting about his father. Uh, well, well, I mean, uh, in a way, I mean, my grandfather was a colonel in the first war, and my father, who was born in 1920, I think, just grew up with the sense that every generation or so there might well be a war, and that all good and true Englishmen would sign up and go and do their duty for for God and the King or whatever it was. And so when the war was looming in um, uh, 1938-9, you could see it coming. He was 19. He signed up. He joined the Northumberland Fusiliers, which had been my grandfather's regiment. And uh, he was sent off uh, in the early days of the war to northern France. He was riding a motorbike, being a, a signals officer, a young signals officer, and, and having having quite a time of it. We've got his diaries from that period. And uh, there was all sorts of stuff. I mean, you know, there were lots of young lads out there and, and while it was going on, it seemed quite good. Until then, before Dunkirk, the Germans were making a big sweep, and he was among those that got rounded up before Dunkirk. And so from 1940, aged just on 20, through to 1945, aged 25, he was marched around Germany, Poland, um, uh, Austria at one point, um, and he, he lost more than half his body weight. Um, he was quite a, a stocky chap when he went in. And when he came out, he was as thin as a rake. And he never really put that much weight on um, throughout much of the rest of his life. But um, it obviously colored who he was. Um, we, he didn't like so many. He didn't talk much about it. He had seen horrible, horrible things done and no doubt heard horrible things said. Um, and he was just glad somehow to have been one of those who made it back home and worked very hard um, and uh, brought up four of us children and lived to see grandchildren and great-grandchildren and was just solidly grateful to God. He was a faithful churchman throughout his adult life and just solidly grateful to God for the extraordinary good fortune that he'd had to make it back home, I think, apart from anything else. Yeah, Yeah. well, my story is a little bit uh, less dramatic. I, I pretty much joined the army because my grades weren't good enough to get into university. So you know, and my and my career as a uh, as a musical theatre lyricist was not kind of like kicking off as I already planned. I wasn't getting the offers from Andrew Lloyd Webber to um, co-write his new musical with him. Too too much alliteration. Too much <laughs> alliteration. That's right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I served as a, a paratrooper uh, for a while, which was which was good uh, military intelligence. But then you know I became Christian while I was in the army. So, you know, just um, attending a, a Baptist church in Sydney, and that was, you know, you know life-changing, obviously. At that point, I'd, I thought I'd rather help people than hurt people, so I wanted to become an army chaplain. 
But as I went through seminary, it became apparent. I actually did have some, you know, academic giftings. And, you know, so I went on in, in a career. But um, you're serving in military intelligence. It was a lot of fun. I loved it. It's kind of like being 12 hours ahead of the news cycle. You, um, you, 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 you get to learn a lot of cool things and uh, hang out with some very, very interesting people. I've met some very interesting ex-FSB officers and Israeli intelligence people. Uh, yeah, and I guess like Tom, we, we look at the world today and we, we do have a lot of concern if you look at the, uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, the possibility of a hot war between uh, China and Taiwan, Venezuela and Guyana, you know, the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong, the dictatorship in Myanmar, um, the, the, and the rise of Christian nationalism in different places. And then you've got the prospect of economic catastrophe, economic turmoil, and all sorts of all, you know, things going around the world. Look at the Red Sea, uh, Islamic insurgency in Nigeria. The world is a dangerous place. And I mean, at one level, it's always been that way, but I tend to think, I, I don't think the world has been this bad since like the 1930s. We, we, yeah. I, you feel like it's just, you're just waiting for like one Archduke Ferdinand to get shot and the, the, the whole, the whole world is going to go to pot very, very yeah, quickly. Yeah. I mean, I, I was, I was too young really to know what was going on with the Cuban Missile Crisis. I remember hearing about it. I think I was 12 or 13 at the time and I was at boarding school and somebody mentioned it, but it, it seemed very unreal. It was like odd stuff people were talking about. We didn't really know what it meant. But when I look back now, that was a very, very dangerous moment, a kind of potential flash, flash point in 1962, was it? I, I'm, I'm not too sure around then. Um, but apart from that, um, and you know, that was Cold War period, but it was it was quite cold, quite chilly Cold War um, rather than what was, Mike says, what we see now potentially heating up. And I think the question really, as part of the question of this book is, when a Christian is faced with the world in its present crisis, what do we say? Oh, well, uh, it's none of our business because we're not interested in politics. We leave that dirty stuff to the, to the silly politicians because we know that we're going to be out of here. We are off to heaven. And so who cares? And I think a great many Christians around the world today are fed up with that line and want to say, no, actually, if you read the New Testament, it's very concerned with what actually happens in real politique and to real people. Yeah, I think um, part of my interest in this book is uh, I talk a lot about King Jesus, as do you yeah. both. Um, and I get a lot of questions from people about what that means in terms of a real politic. And uh, I need to learn. So I, I definitely sit in this conversation as an amateur and needing to learn. And this book was refreshing and helpful to me. Um, and well, I think I think you do do a good job on the one hand of not dictating policies, um, as you say in the preface. Um, and I can read a bit from it there. Uh, what you say is uh, we're not going to tell Christians what they should think about abortion, gun con con control, Brexit, Trump, climate change, racial justice and other hot button issues. So on the one hand, you're not doing that. But on the other hand, you're not offering, as you say, an abstract theory of statecraft that never comes to land in real life. You're doing something uh, kind of in the middle of that. And I'll, I'll let you speak to that a little bit more. How would you position your book then? Like, what exactly is your aim? Well, I think our aim is to do a little bit of practical political theology. So we're not saying, you know, you know, France has recently decided to change their constitution to uh, make abortion a constitutional right. I mean, that's one big conversation uh, about ethics. But we, we want to start off by talking about, well, what is the state actually for? Why does God give us government? Why is government a form of common grace? So we want to start like that. Then we want to look at some history. Like, you know, what has been the relationship of God's people to empire in the Old Testament, in the Roman times? And then, and what about now when, you know, when the Roman empire became Christian and, and what about, you know, the British empire or the, you know, the quasi America? I mean, what's the role of Christianity within empires, ancient and modern? And then we want to go through some of the, the, the technical questions you've got to look at. And this there's a great chapter by Tom on this, the relationship between spiritual powers and political powers, because some people like to think it's, you know, a bit of a, a, a two-stage drama. You've got kind of like the earthly powers down here and then the heavenly powers up heaven and, and there's not really much to do with each other but i think tom does a great chapter saying no these two things are actually interrelated and then of course we've got to work through the material like well what do you do with romans 13 about submit to governing authorities is that an absolute statement that you should 
always obey? Should we be telling the Christians in Ukraine, well, you know, if you're living in a region under Russian occupation, therefore you should be obeying the governing authorities or, or the Hong Kong, uh, the Hong Kong protesters saying, well, no, you, you need to pack up your protest and, and go back home because you're now living under, I mean, we want to tackle those questions and then talk about, mate, is there a type of government that Christianity should support? Maybe not. There's no government that's completely ideal or there's the one true government, but is there some some principles here might that might force us to uh, prefer some modes of government than others? So it's more questions like that rather than, so what do you think about immigration? Because I, I think Tom and I agree, when you get those big questions sorted, then you're, I think, more equipped to be able to tackle the real... Um, detailed and delicate issues that come up in your context. Yeah. And I think many, many Christians, certainly in my country right now, and I think in America, which is the country I know sort of second best to my own, um, many Christians get seduced by the easy either or that is presented to them, both politically and, alas, theologically, so that if we're with this person on this issue, we assume we're going to agree with them all down the line. And if we're against that person on whichever issue, we uh, assume we're going to disagree with them all down the line. And I want to say life is much more interesting and complicated than that. But we've got to, uh, until you back off from the specific list of, as Mike says, hot button issues and look at the, the larger picture of how saying Jesus is Lord affects what you do as a citizen of your country. Until you look at that picture in the round, you're not in a position to start making those knee jerk jumps to support this or be against that. And I, I think that that. That is a question which most Christians, certainly in my experience, have not faced. Growing up, I never heard sermons about how these two interact, the political allegiance and the allegiance to Jesus. I never heard sermons on the extra bit in the so-called Great Commission. You know, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Well, Okay, many people will be happy to say Jesus has all authority in heaven. We've hardly begun to imagine what it might look like to say he has all authority on earth. But it doesn't look like that if you look out of the window. On the other hand, if you look at the rise of the early church, Jesus' authority is not about people yelling at each other and telling him what to do or sending in the tanks and forcing people to, to, to be Jesus-like people. It's about ordinary um, Joe and Josephine uh, on the street who are um, peace-loving, who are peacemaking, who are humble, who are loving, who are caring for the poor, who are hungry for the kingdom and for God's justice. In other words, Sermon on the Mount people getting out there doing stuff. That's what transformed things in the first three or four centuries. And it's what still transforms things now. And then when that meets the question of the governing authorities, what happens? What's that going to look like? Where are the pitfalls? What's happening? And I think, as I say, most Western Christians have never heard sermons on this, have never heard uh, Bible study teaching on this. And as Mike says, Romans 13 appears to be a problem, but that's because it's only seven verses, for goodness sake, and it's Paul basically saying to the Christians in Rome, we are not here in order to promote a kind of religious anarchy, um, because, well, I say obviously, and I think it is obvious, um, actually anarchy is even worse than tyranny, but God wants his world to be wisely governed, so that even when the governing authorities are not doing a very good job, God still wants there to be governing authorities, because if there's anarchy, then the bullies and the bad guys always win, instead of merely sometimes winning with tyranny. And for me, one of the crucial moves in this game, and I think I uh, discussed this in, my, in the chapter that Mike referred to, is when in John 19, Pontius Pilate says to Jesus, don't you realize I have authority to have you killed? Jesus says, you couldn't have any authority over me unless it was given you from above. So the one who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Now, if even Jesus, the word made flesh, can say that about the second rate local representative of uh, the emperor in Rome, then I think that is, in a, in a way, one of the beginning points of political theology. But going with that is the mandate in John 16, where Jesus says, when the Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. How does the Spirit do that? By enabling the church to speak truth to power. So there is both recognition that God wants the world to be ordered and the responsibility, which the church has regularly abrogated these last few hundred years, actually to look the power in the eye and say, in the name of God, this is what you ought to be doing. 
And, and I think that's somewhere near the heart of what we're trying to get at in this book. Yeah, thank you. I think um, one of the great strengths of the book is you never lose sight of the central task of the church to proclaim Jesus's kingship and to bear witness to Jesus. And also, I think that you at the same time um, don't just slip off into an ethereal, a lack of direction for um, for Christians to, to, to think about real world governance. And I think um, let's walk through some um, maybe some aspects of chapter six, uh, which was your your chapter was titled uh, the church resisting the powers, as you got quite specific there about certain kinds of government uh, that the church should not support and um, and how to navigate that as Christians. And I thought that was a particularly helpful uh, part of the book. So the first um, form of government that you're warning Christians against would be totalitarianism. So first of all, what is it? Um, and uh, if you want to illustrate where you see it happening today or where it's concerning you, that's great too. But then maybe we can think about, like, why should it be resisted from a Christian standpoint? Why resist totalitarianism? Mike, I think this one starts off with you. Yeah, I mean, uh, Hannah Arendt, the great Jewish-American political philosopher, she differentiates between a, desp- a despotic state and a, and a to- to- totalitarian state. She says a, a, a despot is just a guy who flaunts the laws of his own country. Okay, so he just acts in a lawless way. A totalitarian state is where they deliberately cultivate terror uh, as the weapon to control the population and extend their reign. So I I think that's the difference. And, you know, the two examples we have are obviously um, the the, the Soviet Union, uh, particularly during the phase of of Stalin, but, but after as well, was a terror state and other communist regimes as well. And of course, you've also got um, uh, the Nazi Germany, and you know, I and for me, people say, well, we don't live in you know Nazi Germany, we don't live in the Soviet Union, and I would, I would simply refer to your own wonderful country, Matt, uh, a week gone by, where you had neo Nazis marching in Nashville, and the Communist Party having a parade in New York. So we might think that no one in their right mind um, would engage in these, but for some people, these these dreams of you know. Utopia is just one violent purge away. Uh, those dreams still seem very seductive. And and again, Hannah Arendt talks about the 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 people have an, an attraction to the more the morbidity of evil. Uh, it's it's kind of like people who want to go see a dead body. People have a, an attraction to the morbidity of evil, and that never goes away. So that's why we're concerned about the totalitarian side. Yeah, I think as you put it, there's um, something along the lines of. Uh... It doesn't matter if you have to go through a, a couple caverns of hell in order to get to the utopia; it's worth it. <laughs> Something along those lines. I don't remember what you said, but yeah, uh, and that is, that is, as it were, a parody of the Christian gospel of Jesus going to the cross in order to redeem the world, and and that theme of um, you know the terrible suffering, but we'll come through the other side, and then the new world will emerge. That that's there in the um, BC Jewish writings. Think of the books of the Maccabees and so on. So it's it, it's kind of uh, a temptation which is always there, and indeed in all sorts of ways, of course, um, Marxism was a, a, a Jewish heresy, as it were, that the, the, the suffering at the present time is because of the new world which is to be born. It's just that Marx, you have that um, Jewish eschatology, but without God. It's got to happen from below. It's got to happen by the proletariat rising up or whatever. And being able to analyze these movements and see where they come from and where they borrow from Judaism or Christianity, but then distort it and twist it and why that happens. I think that's really important. I mean, I'm not a political philosopher. I just have have dabbled over the years. But being able to recognize some of these things is enormously important, not least because then looking for the signs of where they might appear next. And in Britain at the moment, we're having a terrible time because of what's going on in Gaza is producing, on the one hand, um, many people who are saying some pretty brutal anti-Semitic things because they can't stand what they see on the television in terms of the present Israeli Netanyahu government and what they're doing. But on the other hand, some people who are making deeply anti-Islamist um, statements. And it's bizarre to think that British politics would be uh, on a knife edge between anti-Semitism and anti, um, uh, anti-Muslim. anti But that's where we are at the moment. And the church is stuck because 
It simply doesn't want to get it wrong, doesn't want to say nasty things about anybody, but has very little to offer by way of larger analysis of what's actually going on globally and of how a wise Christian, be it politician or church person, ought to comment on and give direction in such a time as this. Well, you uh, you uh, described a situation in uh, Britain, but it's the same in the U.S. There's some high-profile academic cases that have um, been speaking about, uh, you know, the kind of the Israeli-Palestinian problem, and uh, lots of uh, it's been it's been all over our media too. So uh, it's uh, the stuff right, happening right. in Gaza is uh, affecting us as well. Um, let's go to then um, the next topic: Christian nationalism that uh, you both uh, identify as on the rise. Uh, and of uh, 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 imminent concern. Uh, so uh, where is it happening? What is it? Uh, what's a Christian response? Yeah, well, and this is where Tom and I want to point out something. Uh, it's it's You've got to differentiate between Christian nationalism, which is the idea that Christians must be in charge. They must kind of impose a sort of nominal Christianity on the masses, often through means of coercion. Or and something that they they must be in charge, but uh, at least symbolically. But you know, and they need their big sort of you know strong man in charge. We want to differentiate from that, where you simply recognise that the culture you live in has been shaped by Christianity, and you have a Christian heritage, and you can have varying degrees of cooperation between church and state. Uh, most of our Western societies have a degree of secularity, but that secularity doesn't have to be an absolute divide between church and state. I mean, you, you, I think you need a division. You can't have the church only as a department of the state. But that doesn't mean you can't have a gate between them where people can go and talk each other and cooperate and, and do business. Now, that'll be different in different countries. Say, for you know, in the Church of um, England, um, it is what you would call an established church, much like the Church of Sweden. But even with a certain degree of healthy secularity in the United Kingdom. So on the one hand, we want to say there's good levels of church-state cooperation. The problem is when Christianity some just simply becomes a tool to prop up a political project. And that's when you get the dangers of Christian nationalism. And I've just finished reading a book on Christian nationalism, and it was, it was appalling. It was basically using Christianity as a license for segregation and all sorts of um, ethno-nationalist projects. And Christianity was just the, the window dressing on it. Yeah, and which is extraordinary when, I mean, one of the things I've been banging on about the last few years, as you both will know, is the way in which in Paul's letters in Galatians, Ephesians, all over the place, um, neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, no male and female, the neither Jew nor Greek is, is not just an extra little bit of sociology tacked on to the end of a gospel which is about something else. In Ephesians, it's very clear, and I think this is why some people, not least liberal Protestant Germans in the 19th century, did not want Ephesians really to be Pauline because it's actually very clear about the coming together of different ethnicities within the body of Christ and how that is a witness to the principalities and powers that Jesus is Lord and they aren't. And I suspect that some of the movements um, political philo philosophical movements in Germany in the in the nineteenth century were were deeply opposed to any any such thought that they they might actually lose their ethnic identity within the larger multi ethnic uh, the church as in Revelation seven where people of every nation and tribe and tongue get together and so the, the, if there is to be Christian influence in a nation it ought to be an influence which says this is what the true church looks like. And one of the paradoxes at the moment is that so many people within secular governments and, and, and local societies think that they want something that they have called multiculturalism, but you can't actually get healthy multiculturalism, I think, without having Jesus at the heart of it. Um, in a sense, the Roman Empire tried to pull everybody together into one great blob, and economically, they were more or less part of the same system, but it was chaos because there was no means of enabling people to work together and live together in harmony. Um, but the church ideally ought to be working at that. The tragedy is that for the last 400 years, we've so concentrated on getting souls into heaven after they die, and we've forgotten the business about what the church is supposed to look like here and now as the family of all nations who come to worship the God revealed in Jesus. And that's, 
that's a huge issue which I think needs to be back at the centre of the agenda. And uh, it's not about, you know, are some churches racist or whatever. No doubt most churches have been and many still are in some way or other. But let's not just have this thing called racism. We say, oh, that's nasty. We don't want to be that. Let's have the larger positive vision of what God wants to do by reconciling people in Christ to one another and to God's purposes for the world. That's why the multi-ethnic... Um, the multi-ethnic church is such a powerful, symbolic, and real witness to the gospel. Absolutely. When you when, when you see it, when you see it, you know it. It's kind of, wow, this is what it's meant to be like. Yeah. And the irony is the church tends to be more ethnically diverse than many of its critics these days. I always find that fiercely ironic. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's, uh, that's an encouraging word, especially when we think about the nationalist threat, uh, that the church is making yep. progress uh, on that front is certainly encouraging. Now, the final category, you have these three warnings of uh, you know governments that um, you're concerned about. Uh, on the one hand, totalitarianism and then nationalism. But the third one was perhaps the most surprising, partly because I don't think it's as prominent, at least in most people's minds, as a, a, a real category or a real threat. Certainly the category was new to me, although the ideas behind it uh, were not uh, necessarily new. Uh, and uh, that is the uh, the category that you call uh, a, a civic totalism. Civic totalism. Uh, could you unpack that for us, Mike? Civic totalism. Yeah, you might say that this is the uh, soft left-wing version of authoritarianism. That's where the state takes upon itself the the prerogative to regulate as much of people's personal, private, and religious life as possible. So the state says, "Look, everyone's allowed to have beliefs and values, but you've got to you've got to make sure they align well with the progressive vision." And of course, as as, as Tom can point out, what, the progressive stuff keeps changing, and the uh, the whole idea of, of of progress is one of the great cultural myths. And let, let, me, let me give you an example, a concrete example of how, how this has played out in Australia. Uh, Australia. Australia is pretty good, I think, on church-state relationships. You know, we're still trying to work out some stuff about religious freedom and, and LGBT stuff, but generally we're pretty good. But we had a, uh, we have a, a municipality called the Australian Capital Territory, and there was a Catholic hospital there. And the local government had done an audit you know, after Roe v. Wade was overturned in America and everyone around the world, because you know, we all think we live in America, they kind of panicked on this and they said, we need to do a review of uh, abortion services. And they noticed that this one hospital, um, Catholic owned, and it did not perform pregnancy terminations. And it was about two months later, this government decided they were going to forcibly acquire the hospital. And so that they basically announced where we're going to take this hospital over. We'll, you know, we'll give you a bit of money for it, but we're taking it over, and that is that. And you know, and this this was I mean, despite they're saying, well, we're just trying to reorganize and rationalize health services in the area. There was no doubt what their motivation was because the, the the hospital would not do abortions or euthanasia. They would not kill on behalf of the state, effectively. And you know, and I remember that the Catholic Church protested. They did. They did all sort of lawsuits trying to prevent it, but it, it came to naught. And the federal government refused to um, to overrule the action. And I'll never forget seeing um, on on Sunday on on a Sunday. Couldn't wait till Monday on a Sunday when Catholics were at worship. They sent in a crane and a crew to take the cross down off the church, and and it looked like a scene from China. Yeah, you know, it looked like something I'd, I'd, I'd seen the same thing. But in China, where they're kind of like you know, you know, bringing churches down, and this was a nakedly punitive act against a religious community by a you know somewhat uh, ter territory government because of a group's religious beliefs, and you know, I, and this what this was on the news, and I wrote to people. I thought, do you realize what you've normalized? You what you you've normalized <laughs> taking punitive acts against a religious community. And you might think, oh, yes, but this is for abortion. This is for a, for a good cause. But what about the next guy? What's he going to do? He's going to say, we're going to flatten all the mosques and we're going to put up, you know, uh, something else. Or we're going to, someone's going to say, you know, we've got too many churches and real estates. Or, you know, think what you've normalized. And, and the minute you go around saying that, you know, you can attack people on the base of their religion, it never ends well, whether you're left wing or right wing. And that's the sort of things that I think we've got to watch out for. And 
yeah, I mean, it's concerning for me, and I could give I could give several other examples, but that's where you get a kind of authoritarianism, which people think is in a good cause, but ultimately it's it's uh, an attack not just on religious freedom, it's an attack on our secularism. A secularism is premised on the idea yeah, that yeah. Uh, the government doesn't privilege any religion, and the other side, government doesn't take punitive actions against your religion. Okay, that's the two sides of the, of the coin yes. we've got to remember. But that was what we violated, the violation of religious freedom, liberal democracy, and the, the very purpose of secularity. Yeah, that's, that's really important. And I, I was, I mean, Mike wrote that chapter, and, and I was fascinated by that. I'd not thought around those particular corners. I mean, we increasingly in Britain, more by stealth than anything else, and it's just sort of happening, are moving towards uh, an attempt to legislate for what people actually feel and think inside themselves, whether they actually say or do anything, so that people talk about hate speech, and then they say, ah, but, you know, so-and-so has this stuff, has these beliefs, and therefore we're going to ban them. And, of course, as is well known, the whole so-called cancel culture, where people decide that that person's views are not only hateful but harmful, and I'm, I, I will be afraid if he comes to my university and speaks here or whatever it may be, therefore we will ban them. And, and that's, that's a move in, of exactly the sort, I think, that Mike is, that Mike is meaning. Um, because I, I remember when I was young, People used to say, well, the great thing about um, uh, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount is that this is for those who follow Jesus. Um, of course, it's dealing with motivations about um, murder and hatred, and about adultery and lust and all that. But the law can't touch that, people would say. You can't legislate for people to have the right motives. It feels to me as though we're trying to legislate for people to have the right motives, except that these aren't Christian motives. They are, as Mike says, sometimes from the right and sometimes from the left. Um, but they, they, are, they are destroying that gap which was genuine secularism. And again, I was interested by Mike's analysis of that, the, the desirability of a certain kind of secularism, though obviously neither of us would support the secularism which says uh, there's a little hole for religion over there, but the rest of us are just going to be secular people. Yeah, I, I can give another example from the UK. Um, you, you'll, you'll find this one scary, yeah, Tom. I learned this from Konstantin Kissin. He said, um, but before the, the, the war in Ukraine, um, Russia arrested... Uh, 300 people for committing like on crime, on online crimes, you know, things they'd said on social media. 300 people had been arrested. During the same period in the United Kingdom, 3,000 people were arrested. Okay, so I mean, this is this is pre pre um uh, Ukraine war, but you know, the UK and and there was and there was I read a, I read one story about a lady who had said something on Twitter or Facebook. And she got a phone call from the from the local uh, police department saying, "Yeah, we just want to check your thinking on this matter," which, which exactly, which, which exactly, literally sounds like the you know in the the George Orwell novel, nineteen eighty four, the Thought Police. It, absolutely, it is absolutely. The, literally sounding like the villain, the George Orwell novel. It, it really does, and the irony is the irony the, the irony is that the the British police um, for a long time basically gave up. Um, trying to solve uh, burglary crimes. People would phone up and report a burglary and they would say, OK, you are case number 73524 or whatever. Um, don't call us, we'll call you. And they would do nothing because they were too busy following up thought, thought crimes, etc. Now, we could rant on about this all day, but you, you take the point. Yeah, but, but that's, the, that, that's the, the thing that every aspect of your life has to be political, which is one, which is one emblem. You, you can't separate your, your personal life from your political life. Every aspect has to be political, and the government can, or, or a, an authority has to regulate every aspect of your life all the way down to your thinking. And again, that's, that, that's not like you know neo-Nazis in the street. It's not out there and visible and shocking, but it's that horrible little encroachment, uh, particularly in a technological age where a government wants to regulate as much as your life. And we need to be just as vigilant against that as we are against you know tanks and terrorists yeah, around the yeah. world. Yeah. I really appreciated that section of the book. Let's jump to a speed round to change the pace a little bit. Uh, uh, Mike has done several speed rounds before, so we'll hit uh, Tom with this speed round. Now, the premise here, uh, Tom, is that you don't really get to think about a lengthy answer. You just uh, you just have to speak from the gut. Uh, and so these are designed to be quick. 
All right, so at SBL several years ago, I was sitting with Nije uh, Gupta, Josh Jip, uh, Drew Strait, and we were uh, at a pub, and the bartender wouldn't serve us until we told him what our spirit animal was, which is, I guess, the animal we identify with deeply in our soul. Uh, what's your spirit animal, Tom? Oh, my goodness. I have absolutely no idea. I'm not so much an animal person. I, I would hope it might be a tiger or something like that, something interesting like that. Well, you don't get any food. You get no food until you tell us your animal. No food. No drinks. Well, well, um, if, I, if I swung the camera around, you would see there is a small model tiger over on the wall over there, so I'll go with that. And plus, plus I, I did a sabbatical at Princeton and where the, the tiger is one of their uh, uh, themes, and I have a tiger's tail hanging on my study door, so I, I guess the tiger is what I would go with. Uh, what's a fiction book you'd recommend? Ah, a fiction book I'd recommend. Um, okay, I was rethinking it just uh, today for something, some reason. Chaim Potok's novel, The Chosen, which I think was the first of Potok's novel, which really, uh, really hit the spot. And it taught me so much about the problems of being a Jew in in the 20th century and uh, opened my eyes to all kinds of things. And I followed it up with others, but I go back to that book again and again. That's my favorite of his, too. I've read four or five of his. Um uh, what would a dream vacation look like for you? A dream vacation very easily um, would be to, to, to this place here, which is the house that Maggie and I are building on the Isle of Harris. It's not, it's not quite finished yet. We're going up there in a few weeks' time. We're going to be talking to the builder. We're hoping to be in by June. Um, if you turn around the other way from where that photograph is, you see um, the Atlantic Ocean and the mountains of North Harris, and it can be very cold, it can be very wet. It's one of the most beautiful places in the British Isles. And we've been going there for the last 10 years. And at last, we think we're going to have a retirement home of our own up there. But at the moment, it's been it's been the vacation destination. Fantastic. Uh, I could see the photo, but uh, we're doing uh, audio only. So uh, listeners aren't going to get to see the photo. You have to post it online sometime, Tom. Um, well, w w when the house is complete, they do we have may a do bunch that. of unwelcome <laughs> guests showing up at your doorstep. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Tom. So, French fries, mashed potatoes, or baked potatoes? Which one are you going to choose? Uh, probably mashed. Uh, do you have any poems memorized? And if you've got one, uh, can you uh, can you share a couple lines with us? Do you have a, a favorite poem? <laughs> oh goodness! When I was very young, I had a very good English literature teacher who from the age of, I don't know, about 10, made us learn whole chunks of Shakespeare so I could give you the whole of, oh, that this tutu solid flesh would melt, thaw and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon gates, self-slaughter, and so on. Or um, in, a, in a happier mode, I know a bank where on the wild time grows, where oxlip on the nod nodding cowslip blows. There sleeps Titania some time of the night, lulled in these flowers by dances and delight. And there the snake throws her enameled skin, weed wide enough to wrap a fairy in. And wow, so on and beautiful. so on and so on. And it, it's quite extraordinary. I, I ingested those when I was, as I say, 10, 11, 12, 13, and I've still got them. And of all the great poems I've learned, um, the the one would be uh, uh, Gerald Manley Hopkins. The world is charged with the grandeur of God, and you both know it. And uh, it still resonates very deeply. I'm not so highbrow, though. I uh, most of my poems I do for my children. We do a lot of Shel Silverstein, but um, we do uh, we do <laughs> we do some others as well. So I know I know a great poem about C. H. Dodd, a limerick. A limerick about C. H. Dodd. You got to do it. You got to do it, Mike. What's your limerick? Okay. There once was a man called Dodd whose name was exceedingly odd. He spelt, if you please, his name with three Ds when one is sufficient for God. <laughs> right. Okay. okay. I, 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 it's reminding me um, uh, at that level, John Betjeman wrote a lovely poem about the conversion of St. Paul. And in the middle of it is a bit which I think I quote um, as the epigraph for one of the bits of my big book, Paul and the Faithfulness of God. St. Paul is often criticized by modern people who are annoyed at his conversion, saying Freud explains it all, but they omit the really vital part of it, which isn't how it was achieved, but what it was that Paul believed. And uh, Betjeman is, is, has that light touch, but actually is razor sharp getting to the heart of the issue. What, what, what mattered for Paul was who is Jesus? What's this all about? All right. And our last one, we always ask our guests, Mike has done this one before, but for you, what is the most important book in biblical studies or theology in the last 50 years? The one that's, this could be personal, not so much for the field, but for you personally. 
Okay, I think the one that opened my eyes, uh, and I go back to this again and again, was Ben Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R, The Aims of Jesus, which came out, I think, in 1979. And Meyer was an extraordinary scholar, an ex-Jesuit who had all the European languages and all the ancient Semitic languages, etc. And he opened my eyes to see how, um, say, the Dead Sea Scrolls were relevant for understanding the world into which Christianity was born, etc., and for understanding that the question at the heart of the quest for the historical Jesus is what was Jesus actually trying to do, which most people seemed to ignore. And he opened that right up for me. And I know that's a generation ago, but it's still a book that I really, really value. Well, it's, I think you've led many other people down that rabbit trail who have followed your footnotes uh, as I, I've read it, uh, as I read New Testament, the people of God, Jesus, the victory of God. You you praised his work so highly that uh, you, you sent lots of people uh, chasing him down. So it was no surprise is what I just said. Uh, no, I don't think any other. Uh, it, I, I've asked this question to many, many guests, and you're the first to mention Myers. So uh, it's, Interesting. It's, Interesting. it's nice. Uh, nice tribute. Um, so let's go back uh, back into our kind of uh, political conversation here. Um, and uh, one of the things that I uh, thought was interesting, and this pertains to the discussion of powers, uh, and that I don't know that I'd noticed but you, uh, before in my reading of Colossians, but you mentioned uh, that, of course, the powers are created by Christ, right? They're defeated by his cross, but you also notice that they're reconciled. And I don't know that I'd ever noticed that before. Uh, what's the significance of the reconciliation of the powers uh, for understanding a Christian political theology? So how does this fit in? Yeah. The, I mean, if I can jump in first, Mike, but you've written a commentary on Colossians as well. Um, it, it seems to me that, as people have often said, uh, the, the powers stop being demons when they stop being gods. When human beings worship that which is not God— they create monsters, they create Frankensteins, and whether it's money, sex, or power, or the many derivatives therefrom, they become gods, and they take over people and families and societies. Um, but really, uh, money is a, a God-given thing, but to be used in God's way, preferably by giving it away. Sex is a God-given thing, but to be used in God's way in its proper context. Power is necessary within God's world. God wants his world to be ordered. But if people who have power um, glorify themselves in that power and use it as a, a step towards self-aggrandizement, then they become demonic. But when that is named, shamed, dealt with, defeated on the cross, then God's world still wants to be a place where people can do business with each other, a place where families can thrive, a place where God's order is worked out in the world. And that would be the reconciliation, where you get wise, humble, shrewd, well-thought-out government. There you have a power that has been reconciled, that is not trying to make itself bigger than its boots, but is actually doing the job that God wanted God wanted it to do. And, and that would be a very concrete example of the reconciliation of the powers. I mean, that, that it's so clear in, Col in the second half of the Colossians hymn or poem or whatever it is, uh, Colossians 1 verses, well, uh, 18 through 20, um, that, that they're reconciled through Christ. And then in chapter 2, yes, he has defeated them on the cross. Mike, I'm assuming you broadly are in agreement with that. I forget what you say at that point. Yeah, de definitely in a, in a, in agreement that you know the the element of reconciliation is not just between uh, me and my God. It's it's the whole creation is going yeah. to be reconciled. Every, all of the enmity that is you know within everything material and spiritual, all that is going to be brought back to its proper pristine state and order, and will be in the in the harmony that God intends all things. So yeah, that's. That's that's I think that's a great theme of what you, of what reconciliation means in its full cosmic and spiritual senses. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's partly because we've often forgotten what is so clear in again Ephesians, and I know Ephesians is off limits for some people, but Ephesians one ten that God's plan is to join all things together in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. Now, that can only happen if all the bits and pieces have been reconciled to one another and to God. Um, and But if that's the aim, and if the church is, as I've now often said, the small working model of that new creation, then, boy, do we have an agenda for the church's witness in the multiverse, the, the, the multicultural society of our day. 
Um, and that's that's the witness to reconciliation. Tragically, there are some though there are some places where the church can be a witness to that reconciliation. Often, it's been the other way around. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak on the one hand to um, maybe some of the questions that people are going to have that are more practical questions about like can um, a Christian serve as part of the government? Like, is there ever any uh, opportunity to use violence to overthrow a tyrant? Um, and then maybe um, more, um, as you kind of wrap up your vision, to talk about like the idea of uh, government as the servant of God and about um, how this all relates to liberal democracy. Um, that's quite a bit, and we're starting to run shy on time. So let's, um, let me give you a chance to speak to some of those practical questions as you wish, um, briefly, although they're complicated questions and you may want to add nuance. But uh, can a Christian... Um, uh, serve in government. Anabaptists have said no, but you guys say yes. Why? Uh, I'll, I'll hand that. I'll hand that one to. I think Tom, Tom will be good for that one. I'll do the civil disobedience yeah, one. Okay. I mean, uh, I was for seven years when I was Bishop of Durham. I was a member of the House of Lords, and though because I lived at the other end of the country, I wasn't able to get into the Lords as often as I might. I was able to speak on all sorts of issues. Some of them I was able to speak specifically as a Christian leader. Um, for, for instance, when we were debating euthanasia, I was trying to speak from a Christian point of view, which is difficult in the House of Lords, but can be done, and it is broadly respected. And But I, I spoke on lots of other issues, um, such as constitutional reform, such as the future use of our coal stocks, um, of all sorts of issues which were coming up, which it seemed to me that wise thinking through of the issues could be done. And though probably some of what I said, maybe most of what I said on such topics could have been said by somebody who wasn't a Christian, I think the fact of a Christian leader speaking on issues of national importance um, makes its own point that actually the church can join, can link arms with the rest of the country in saying, what is the path of wisdom here? Not that we in the church have a monopoly on wisdom, but we may actually have an inside track in some respects, and we may see round some corners which others mightn't. And that was certainly the basis on which I did what I could, um, which wasn't very much. I, I should say as a footnote, many people, particularly in America, look at uh, England and think, oh, uh, church and state um, isn't that wicked? And, and does that mean that the church tells the state what to do or the state tells the church what to do? And the answer is neither of the above. There are only usually ever one or two bishops actually present in the Lords at any one time because they've all got very busy jobs and they have to take time out to go into the Lords and take their day there and, and, and speak to a particular issue. So it isn't a question of the church running the government or the government running the church, though the government has tried from time to time in ways not completely dissimilar to what Mike was saying about the, the Catholic hospital. But in principle, yes, as with post constantinianism in general, if uh, the, 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 the nation says we want a voice for God in our councils of state, then the church should not say, oh, no, no, you don't want that at all. You just get on and decide things in your secular way, and we will snipe from the sidelines. That's just plain silly. Yeah, so the church should serve it in an advisory capacity is something you, you, um, you certainly emphasize as one of its many roles, but that an advisory one is an important one. Yeah, yeah, ad advice, advice, and and warning, and sometimes holding up the mirror to power, and just being able to say, "Do you realize what you're just doing here?" How about uh, Mike? The question then of 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 s the limits of civil obedience and uh, of the tyranny, and I mean, you know, I mean, one of the questions I, I get my students to uh, answer is, "Would Saint Paul rather be Nero's chaplain or Nero's assassin sure. if Paul had, was given a choice?" <laughs> What he had to choose. I love you, Mike. That's a great question. It is. It is. And um, you know, if you if you maybe the the early years of Nero's reign, he would say chaplain, and maybe in the later years of Nero's reign, <laughs> he'd say assassin. So maybe it could be a bit of both. But that, that that's the question. And here's the thing: Christians had to answer this over a lot of history. What do you do if you're ruled by a a wicked emperor, a wicked king, um, a corrupted aristocracy? It wasn't a new question, and it, what I found very interesting is one of the stories that was frequently cited was the one where uh, David refuses to kill King Saul, and he just like cut off a bit of his garment, 
uh, and he says, look, you know, he shows it to Saul, look, you know, when you were, you know, relieving yourself in the cave, I, I could have like killed you, but I didn't. And a lot of people use that as an example that, you know, government is appointed and you shouldn't resort to that kind of a thing. Uh, it, it did change a bit with the English Revolution. Uh, also, the the, the the English uh, with um with uh, Cromwell and and his gang, they were they were they were a little bit yeah, but you know, Saul did get his comeuppance eventually, didn't he? And you know that wasn't really all that bad. And again, during the uh, American War of Independence, or as Tom, as I would call it, the uh, American Wall of of ungrateful colonists not knowing who their betters are. Um, they also debated Romans 13 about, you know, how do you stand up against tyranny? And then also during the American Civil War, both sides were using the language of, of tyranny. So when, is there a time when you can engage in civil disobedience and even uncivil disobedience? Generally, I think the church has always preferred uh, peaceful civil, civil disobedience. And you could argue that peaceful civil disobedience historically tends to be more effective than violent disobedience. And the two examples I give in the book, I give the example of the uh, Cristero Rey revolt in Mexico in the 1930s, where you had a government in Mexico really did brutally suppress um, the Catholic Church in the 1930s. So, and, and it was quite a brutal repression. And they, there was a peasant army that sort of rose up and tried to fight the, the, the federales, the federal troops, as a kind of religious war for, for Catholic freedom. Uh, and you can debate how successful they were. Eventually, the government did sort of, you know, stop on their anti-Catholic policies, and they either rolled back laws or they refused to enforce them. So, I mean, so you could say, did it work? Did it work? Maybe not. But then look at the way uh, Catholics led the fight against communism and that kind of authoritarianism in Eastern Europe. Yeah. Look at John Paul uh, II and the Solidarity Movement. I've just finished reading the autobiography of a, um, a Czech Catholic priest called Thomas Halet and his role as part of the Catholic resistance in you know Czechoslovakia. And you could argue that the more peaceful movements tend to be more successful than violent movements. And I think we've also got to differentiate between being violent and being subversive. You know, we can we can do things that undermine the a government's ability to impose its will on the people without necessarily being violent. You know, in, a, in an age of lies and terror, one of the most subversive things you can do is speak the truth. Yeah, yeah. And often, you know, simply speaking the truth and telling people not to believe the lies of, of the government. And can I say, I think this is going to become more important because I don't know whether you've been checking out this thing called AI. You can now create videos showing just about anything. So imagine videos that are attributing words or speeches to all sorts of political figures. You know, I've seen, you know, a, someone made a fake AI video about Joe Biden telling people not to turn up and vote uh, in the primary just to wait till the, the federal election. And I mean, that, that was done deliberately as an example of what you could do. But look, we, we live in an age um, where I think the truth, uh, not just what's before your eyes, but the actual truth is going to become a far more precious commodity than ever. And often that is the best weapon uh, political dissidents, and I think the church has. Wow, that's great. And uh, uh, I, I've just finished expounding Ephesians in Wycliffe Hall here in Oxford. And in the last chapters, the truth comes out so strongly that truth, the truth of God's good creation and the truth is the belt that holds all the rest of the army to, armor together and so on. So I'm, I'm delighted to hear you say that, Mike, and I'm fully, fully with you. Well, do you guys want to make a final statement, uh, one of you two, about uh, your vision here for uh, the church, what you would like hope most OnScript listeners might take away? Uh, you've spoken about, uh, obviously, the, the church as something that God uses as a servant. Uh, you've advocated for liberal democracies, and we haven't even hardly gotten into that conversation. What's your wrap-up word that you want well, to say? I, I would want to say to to Christian people who are genuinely puzzled by the maelstrom of stuff that's going on on both sides of the Atlantic and in Europe and in Australia and all over the place, pause and pray and think and don't rush in to acting or speaking on a knee-jerk reaction to what you've just read in the paper or heard on the television or whatever. Instead, go back to Scripture, to the Psalms, to Jesus, to the Gospels, to Revelation, 
uh, pause and pray and think, and let's pray particularly for one another for fresh wisdom, because, boy, we're going to need it in the days to come. Yeah, I would, I, I would say two things, one in the sort of the critical and then one in the positive. I would say critical, be wary of people who want to Caesarize Jesus and Christify Caesar. So that, that's, that's, that's the one thing I would say. Beware of people who want to Caesarize Jesus and Christify Caesar. The second thing I would, be, I would tell people more positively is, you know, the biblical vision is that uh, one day uh, we'll all sit under our own vine and fig tree and none shall make them afraid. You know, most people know that from Hamilton, which goes back to the letter of George Washington, which, of course, he got from the book of Malachi. Uh, but but that vision is actually a good vision, and the church in the present should be a foretaste of that, a sign, a billboard of a world where we can all sit under our own vine and fig tree and none shall make them afraid. Uh, the most repeated command in the Bible is do not be afraid because God is goodness and his goodness and love will eventually conquer all. And we, we our positive message needs to be advertising and promoting and praying for that very end. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to thank you very much, Mike and Tom, for being my guests today. You've been listening to On Script, hosted by Matthew Bates. My guests have been N.T. Wright and Michael Bird, who have been speaking about their brand new book, Jesus and the Powers, Christian Political Witness in an Age of Totalitarian Terror and Dysfunctional Democracies published by SPCK slash Zondervan in 2024. Purchase it wherever great books are sold, or if you prefer to support on script through your purchases, you can follow the link on our webpage, www.onscript.study. Thanks for listening. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study slash donate.